morning. Hi, I'm Todd. I'm feeling very worried because I'm actually in the process of buying a Volvo. <laughs> but I think that means maybe I'm very old. I'm not sure. Okay. So uh, great to be here. Actually, uh, I never would have thought I'd be standing here on stage in 2019. I, I moved to Malaysia in 2013. I thought I would be here for a few years, and now six have gone. Uh, yeah, so I think it's a really good topic to talk about, as I think you already mentioned, what's keeping the CEOs awake at night. It's because change will never be slower than it is now. And that's what we've seen, so much change also in Malaysia since 2013. Uh, how can I say that? Whoever bought a book on uh, Amazon many years ago? Anyone ever did it? You had a Gmail account? You used early versions of Facebook? iTunes came? started to make a bit of a change to the music industry. What was driving all that? That was about a half a billion fixed internet connections in the world. Now we have eight billion mobile broadband connections. So the change that whatever we experienced up to now will never be slower. So, and even today, when we say uh, the change is very fast with everything, uh, an app for everything, and uh, your kids are online and all that, it's still nothing. So change and the pace of change will speed up. So uh, just very quickly about uh, my company. I mean, Ericsson is a Swedish company, kind of like Volvo, except you could say it's kind of a Chinese company as well. Um, founded 1876. Uh, we've had to reinvent ourselves many, many times from making the very first uh, phone call to, of course, now talking about artificial intelligence. Uh, we have been the one to launch each G, 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G. Now we've been launching 5G in the U.S. and Australia and South Korea. Uh, our core purpose as a company is to innovate technology for good. So an example of what that means uh, when there's like really big natural disasters, for example, uh, earthquake in Nepal a few years ago, uh, we are actually the company under the United Nations that comes in to reestablish communications in that country. We don't have business in Nepal, but we will go in and then uh, reestablish communications. So that's uh, Ericsson as a company. Uh, Ericsson in Malaysia, we've been uh, actually very long term. We came to Malaysia in 1965. Our very first project was to connect Peninsula Malaysia with what was then called Jesselton, 1965, together with Jabatan Telecom for the very first time. Uh, we put the first mobile phone factory into Malaysia in the early 90s. And uh, more recently, and I will come back to that, we've been trialing some technologies that we think will make a, uh, a big difference uh, when it comes to the future of economic growth for Malaysia. So a little picture there with Cellcom. I will come back to that later. So the topic about digitalization, it will impact all industries. So if I give a very broad view, the shipping of goods industry. That's probably a Maersk boat. So the digitization at the beginning will be about productivity gains for each industry. I take the example of shipping. We connected each vessel and every container on each vessel. The original purpose was to try to reduce insurance premiums for Maersk by shipping, I don't know, oranges from uh, Naples to uh, Singapore. And uh, if you don't know that the air conditioning has stopped working in the container, when you stop in Mumbai, then the oranges are ruined, and then you have to pay uh, higher insurance fees because the goods are damaged. That was the original idea. But what really happened with every boat connected is that the captain started using what's essentially a ways for ship captains, finding the best route between Singapore and Amsterdam, better currents. The fuel saved on one trip is enough to power 500,000 homes in Sweden for half a year. Sweden has more expensive energy costs, probably many more homes in Malaysia. So that's the first step, is productivity gains. And productivity gains are a little bit uh, scary for some people. Is anyone here from Bangladesh? No? Okay, good, I'll use the Bangladesh example, because I work a lot with Bangladesh. Bangladesh is uh, pretty famous for the textile industry. There's a Swedish company there, H&M. I think it makes up about 3% of the GDP of uh, Bangladesh. A lot of people work in these uh, factories. But digitalization is going to come there as well. And of course, the fear will be when you go speak to the government, but what am I going to do about all the people, everyone who's working in this industry? So many people are working in textile. 
But the problem is about productivity. It's the competitive advantage. If also the garment industry doesn't transform and embrace the digitalization, some other country will become more productive, will become more competitive. So if a few jobs get displaced in the garment industry because you digitalize, imagine how many will be displaced if Bangladesh is no longer competitive in textile. So it's uh, uh, something that all industries must embrace or they will be disrupted. And I think the previous presentation has really, uh, really highlighted that. But there's a few basic uh, underlying enablers for digitalization. And uh, there's a lot of important enabling technologies. I think we've touched on them a little bit. But from the way that we look at it, we see kind of three basic enablers or triggers. Number one is compute. Anyone here have a, uh, a smartwatch? Someone must have. I don't even have a watch, but yeah, okay, smartwatch. It's getting fixed. <coughs> I have a dumb watch. Okay, smartwatch has as much computing power as two iPhone 4s. Maybe that doesn't mean much. I don't know. It doesn't necessarily mean so much to me. A smartwatch has more compute power than all the compute power we use to put a man on the moon. <laughs> That's how much the compute is developing. And I'm sure a lot of the sessions today will, uh, will highlight that. Storage. Anyone know SD card? It's about the size of a fingernail, yeah? I think if you have a camera, you probably have SD card. I don't have a camera, but my wife does. Um, it's about the size of the fingernail. In 2005, one SD card could hold 128 megabytes, okay? 2015, the same one could hold 128 gigabytes. And probably now, and there must be someone in the room who knows a lot about storage, probably now that same card can do, I don't know, terabyte? I don't know how much, okay. So that's what's happened with commute, compute and storage. And then, of course, connectivity. So I showed you that picture with Cellcom. So that was 2017. That was actually uh, Malaysia's very first 5G trial. Also that year, on existing technologies, LTE, we did a trial. And I mean, I am not uh, at all being critical about the service, but just to give you an idea, because the, it's an old uh, technology. I mean, there's a broadband service in Malaysia called Streamix. It's based on copper. I mean, it's a technology from the 2000s. So my example is just to show how much things have changed. We demonstrated on existing technology on LTE a speed 800 times as fast as StreamX. So you can imagine, with all the development on compute, on storage, and connectivity, these fundamental enablers will be the building blocks that will change every single industry. So we're ready to test a few examples and see if it works, the theory. Let's go and look at a very exciting industry, the refrigerator industry. Okay. So, I mentioned in digitization, the first step will be about uh, improving productivity. So, uh, probably uh, whoever makes a refrigerator, they will start adopting technologies to, for their own efficiency to reduce cost. I mean, we do the same thing for our, uh, our own production of the, of the base stations for the towers. So, you will implement new uh, technologies, you'll start using dark factories and robots to reduce your cost. That's step one. Just like the, the example I gave on Mask to improve their own uh, eff uh, effectiveness in shipping goods. But then the second thing starts happen when you start looking at differentiation. So maybe when I'm out on my scooter in uh, Montchiara, I can check uh, what's happening in my refrigerator and change temperatures or get alerts of what's happening. I find out the milk's low and so I can buy milk down at the store. That will be the second thing starting to come now. But the third thing will be the disruption. I mean, maybe it is so that those who produce refrigerator they will displace Jaya Grocer and all the grocery stores because I'll just buy my grocery stores through the refrigerator because it's not the refrigerator anymore. It's actually a screen where I go in and choose what I want and then uh, food comes. Does it make sense? That's being driven by the connectivity, the compute power in the refrigerator and the storage. So that's one example. We test a few more. So we've already spoken about the automotive in industry. I think the pattern or the formula works just as well. I mean, the first step will be what we've already seen about uh, a better in-vehicle experience. We have the example of BMW where the cars can uh, communicate. 
maybe you have a, a better ability to park because you have the <coughs> sort of artificial intelligence uh, view of how uh, you're parking. I mean, improve the experience, improve the safety. That's number one. But number two, things start to disrupt. So why should I pay so much money every time my car breaks down when all the guy's really doing is loading a new software onto the computer to fix the problem? So what stops me from my app, of my Volvo app or whatever I have, to be able to go in, just like I download the latest software update to my iPhone, to be able to go in and download the latest software update to fix the bug of the problem I'm having with my transmission in my car? So all the shops that are doing, all the fixes, they're gone. And then, of course, the third step could be, as we just discussed, alternatives to vehicle ownership. I mean, the new generation, I mean, they don't even want the car. Even if you have the money and the means to buy a car, I mean, they are using Grab. And then Grab, as we heard, I'm sure that will be disrupted for something else. For the same reason, eventually there will be autonomous vehicles and uh, you won't have your own car anymore. You will use the car as it comes. Again, driven by the same three principles around connectivity, compute and storage. Let's take one more example. Agriculture industry. Even without uh, oil palm, I think agriculture makes up 10, 11% of the Malaysian GDP. So I think this is also quite an important one for Malaysia. I mean, the first one might be uh, to lower barriers to entry into, into agriculture. So maybe a slightly different pattern. It means that I can get the information it takes as a small time farmer to enter the food production industry. I don't need to have the same amount of technology maybe as I had before, and I don't need to have the same uh, amount of knowledge. Then I can start using technology to really improve the yield of what I do. For example, in the oil palm industry, there you have about a three-day window to harvest the fruit. We use lots of technology to produce the oil palm, but no technology to actually do the operation of the plantation. Imagine if you could be really accurate in how quickly you actually, or how fast you are to pick up the fruit so that your yield improves by 10, 20 percent. It's a lot of money. I think Mr. Chari can do the math on that one. But the final step might be that as the small farmer that I use the technology to enter the industry, I can reach directly to the consumer. So why do you need big companies like Syme Darby anymore? Maybe that will be the disruption that comes. So these are the type of digitization disruptions we're talking about. And then the question is, so what? We've done a study that shows that for every 10% increase of mobile broadband connectivity, that will give a GDP boost of 0.6 to 2.8% on GDP. I think most countries would find that quite interesting, and for sure most governments. We've done another study uh, together with Arthur D. Little that shows that for every 1,000 broadband connections, 80 new jobs are created. And I think this is important when we talk about mobility in, in Malaysia. Broadband doesn't necessarily mean fixed broadband. Despite whatever uh, we want to do, I mean, Malaysia will never be fully connected on fixed broadband. It doesn't uh, economically make sense. The mobility technologies will be extremely important if you come from a place like Kota Baru and you want to get access to, uh, to the internet. So the mobility will play uh, a, an important and complementary role in driving this economic growth. But I think the... Somebody wise once told me that the best time to plant the tree was 20 years ago. But if you forgot to do that, the next best time is right now. And I think the same would be true as well for making sure that the uh, economy is ready to adapt all these new technologies. And these are the uh, sustainable development goals. My favorite one is number 17, which is partnership for the goals. And I think when it comes to the Malaysian economy and uh, enabling all the disruption that can happen in industry, it's really about industry, uh, government, government agencies, and universities working together to really drive the ecosystem forward and to make this disruption happen uh, and also to drive the economy. Thank you very much.